talk to you. <laughs> doesn't even hear me. Anyways, thank you everybody for coming uh, to the uh, State Historical Building. Um, special thanks to uh, IMPA and Produce Iowa for helping us hold this event. I would like to say a few words, guys. Yeah. I'm Dr. Jim Brockton. I'm the president of the Iowa Motion Picture Association. And our members consist of actors, directors, producers, writers, crew, anything that it takes to make a wonderful movie here or video in the state of Iowa. And our website is IMPA.TV. Please go to that. And also, if you become a member or you want to renew your membership, thanks to the grants that we received from Produce Iowa and other grant makers, we did lower our price for uh, fees to join our club. So please do. And I'd like to remind you too that on April 21st is going to be our IMPA uh, award ceremony. It'll be at the Pella Opera House. So April 21st next year, please come and see us in Pella, Iowa. Thank you. If you need to talk to me afterwards, I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Thanks. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Kevin Elbert. I'm, uh, I work with Liz here at Produce Iowa. I um, just want to welcome you guys here on behalf of, of her and myself. Um, she wanted to be here, but she's in Davenport for the Alternating Currents Festival. So um, just want to remind you guys that we, um, I mean, what we do is try to facilitate all the media production here in Iowa, any, any way that we can help out, um, whether it's visiting sets, um, interviewing people. I know I see some familiar faces of some people that I've worked with um, so far in my time here. Um, so if there's any, any way that we can help, uh, go to our website, produceiowa.com, all of our contact info's up there, you guys can reach out. Um, and also just wanted to remind you, we have our media production directory online, which um, you can put in your crew and all your services, and um, it's a good way for productions to find you guys when they come to the state of Iowa. And um, we're really trying to make sure that we get everyone signed up there so that we have um, all the good, all the good uh, resources that we have here in Iowa listed up there for people to find. So. Um, just want to welcome you guys here. Thanks for coming. Um, I know I'm excited to hear it, so that's all I'll say. Thank you. And I am Gabriel Tejeda, uh, Vice President of the Iowa Scriptwriters Alliance. Today is a special day um, because we all share something in common. Iowa and movies. We all have ties to Iowa in one way or another, and we all love watching or making movies one way or another. And today we have two Iowa filmmakers who, to us, they made it, they got their chance, and they're producing Hollywood features. As teenagers, they were two of the top 50 directors selected for Project Greenlight. Uh, they attended the University of Iowa where they were offered a deal with MTV. They wrote, directed, and produced Impulse that was a number one most downloaded short film on iTunes in its first week of release. Now, they have sold their screenplay, A Quiet Place, to Paramount Pictures that will be produced by Michael Bay, starring Emily Blunt, and John Krasinski, who will also be directing. Now, we all have these aspirations, we all have these role models, and we all want our, answer, our questions answered. You know? um, so, without further ado, let's just get this thing started. Uh, we will have 90 minutes uh, to soak up all of their information. We will set aside 30 minutes at the end for questions from the audience, just in case uh, Caleb forgot to ask any questions, or if... Uh, <laughs> Anybody in the audience has uh, want to ask if what their favorite movie is? Anyways, uh, let, please let me introduce to you Caleb Harris, president of the Iowa Script Writers Alliance. Caleb. Uh, yes, as forementioned, my name is Caleb Harris, president of the Iowa Script Writers Alliance. And before we bring our guests on stage, uh, I just wanted to take a quick moment to talk to you about our group and uh, what we do. Um, we meet monthly uh, to bring our scripts together and have them read aloud by professional actors. So uh, if there are any aspiring writers out there and you're looking for constructive criticism from other, uh, other writers in Iowa, or you're looking to hear how your dialogue is sounding, or you just want a chance to network with other filmmakers and producers, the Iowa Scriptwriters Alliance is a great resource for that. You can go online to www.iowascripts.org and you can look us up there. Or if you just want to come and sit in on a, uh, on a meeting with us, we meet at the Urbandale Public Library the last Tuesday of every month, uh, which will be next Tuesday. So if you're inclined, come on out and join us. So yes, let's bring out our guests, Scott Beck and Brian Woods. Test, test. Um, 
So yes, uh, this first question I have here is uh, just pretty standard with anybody that I meet. I'm just going to need a date of birth, social security number. <laughs> uh, uh, no, thank you guys so much for coming out. This really means a lot to us, and it's really inspiring to see people, uh, you know, with the same beginnings as a lot of us had, and then seeing that end result or like where you can make it with you know with the hard work. So I'm really looking forward to picking your guys' brain here and really getting to, to learn like how you got to where you are. Oh, thanks for having us yeah, and thank thanks everyone so for coming out. For yeah, sure. thank you. Um, it, it's always, we, any excuse to come back to Iowa is, is a great excuse. So we're, we're very happy to be here. Awesome. Um, okay, so uh, my first question here is, uh, out of all the careers that are out there, why filmmaking for the both of you? Just, uh, because we're terrible at everything else. <laughs> um, I don't know, like we were kind of bit by the filmmaking bug, as I'm sure many people here um, were, you know, early in life. And so for us as kids, like we were making movies, and I think there was a point in high school where, you know, you start wondering like, where am I gonna go to college? What is that going to mean in terms of like a career path? And just blindly and naively, I think we both were like, let's just double down on this filmmaking thing, and if it doesn't work out, like, there's plenty of jobs out there. We can just work in a movie theater, like, and, you know, you can make ends meet. We did, we did so. work in a movie theater. We did, yeah. Yeah, we can uh, happy to talk many about years. Too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was absolutely what Scott's saying, and I don't think that there was, um, I think the older we got, eventually it transitioned to, like, well, we should probably do this for a living, because we can't, well, we can't just do this forever, um, but early when we were younger, it was just simply, we love making movies with our action figures, and it was just like fun. It was just like something fun that we both kind of yeah, shared. And yeah. It was a hobby, really. Very cool. Um, so can you, can you kind of uh, talk about like that, that beginning for you guys? Like what were some of the first things that you worked on like the, that start into the, like, into the industry? Um, yeah, I mean, just to start like very, very early, like Brian and I met when we were 11 years old. So we've known each other since the sixth grade lunch table. And like those early years were making stop motion movies with our action figures because that was an immediate resource like we had in front of us. And so of course we're gonna use our toys to, to play and make movies. Um, and, and from there like we just started progressing by like shooting short films with our friends. And in high school we became a little more ambitious. We were like, if we're actually gonna make this a career, like. Let's just mimic what the pros are doing. You know, they're, they're, and watching DVD special features kind of taught us, like you write a script, you go into pre-production and you do a casting call and then you shoot the movies and post-production. And, and, and as we were making movies, we were kind of like falling in love with movies. So like our, we, we started acquiring heroes like Martin Scorsese or Paul Thomas Anderson and these really adult filmmakers and we were mimicking that. So like we were doing like our version of Magnolia or Goodfellas um, with zero life experience. Yeah, I mean, we have characters like trying to snort cocaine through like, you know, straws and it's like pixie stick dust, like things like that. Um, so yeah, it was it was a great trial and error. And I think that, that that's the case with any movie you make, but especially like in our early days, like you really find out what's working, you really find out what's not working and hopefully each time out you just kind of, you know, you up your gamesmanship on that. Definitely. Uh, speaking of that, like, what kind of what kind of goals were you guys setting for yourselves? Like, moving from one project to the next. Like, what was like the main focus from what we just did to what we wanted right. to do for the next one? Um, that's such a great question. I'm trying to think if we had thought about that or thought about goals. I think, um, you know, <coughs> Scott and I have a what we kind of call like a healthy competition. So when we were in high school, Scott would make a movie and. I would produce it and he would direct it and I would be really jealous of how good it was. And so when I went to make a, the next movie, which I would direct and then he would produce, I wanted to try to make it even better. And then I was like, that was really well shot. How do I make my movie that way? And so yeah, there was that back and forth. And I don't know if we had necessarily like a specific objective. I think it was just forward momentum. Like, let's just make as many movies as we can. And there was a period when we were like 17, 18 years old, and I, that was like our most prolific time. Like even today, like I think we made um, four feature films and two like short films, and one was the one that um, placed in the Project Green, Green Light competition. And it was just like momentum begets momentum. And I think that was the lesson we learned. Obviously, there's a point in a filmmaking career where things happen much, much slower because you're answering to different people's schedules and timetables, but 
But that was the beautiful thing about making movies back here in Iowa, especially as a kid. Like, you just have, you have time, you have endless resources and actors that are willing to just take, clear their weekends and just shoot, you know, wherever they're needed. And so it was, a, it was a really nice thing. You know, I, I think that that is especially like interesting too, the fact that you guys produce so many feature lengths at such a young age. Um, I, I produced a feature length film uh, right around when I was 19, but it took me almost three years to mm -hmm. finish to finish this. I mean, for you guys, what, what were some of the things that made that successful for you that you were able to produce it so quickly and do so many in one year? Well, I, I mean, that being said, like one of these movies that we're talking about did take like a year and a half start to finish. Um, but I don't know, it, it was, again, just trying to mimic the pro. So like when we were in pre-production for this one film um, that we shot back in like 2003, 2004, we're like, okay, we need a shooting schedule so that this doesn't end up getting out of hand. And a year later, we're like, oh, we never finished that. So um, we broke down the script and we're like, okay, let's shoot this at these locations over the course of like February to like April, I think it was. And we shot for 16 days total, I think it was. And we spent 300 bucks to, to shoot this entire movie. And it was just about kind of planning the production ahead of time as much as possible. And again, like we had no idea what we were doing. We had never like broken down a script before. We just were like, this is how the pros do it. Let's try and attempt to do that. And, and for that film, like it kept it on track and we were able to have it done by like the date we wanted and showed at a local theater. And so it just, I don't know, it was pure naivete and tenacity, I guess, combined. Um, it's, so when it when it came to like some of those first films that you guys were producing after they were uh, completed, did you uh, do you seek out constructive criticism on those? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that was that was always a huge part of our process was um, is like screening our movies, um, you know, at the local IMAX or local movie theaters and inviting in um, criticism and, and hearing what people think. We we used to. Um, we would sometimes like take our movies to like community college and like um, hand out like questionnaire, kind of like test screen scorecards. Yeah, as they do on you know big movies where it's like before the movie's done, usually you have like sometimes four or five uh, private screenings, either friends and family or a recruited audience where they'll be like, if you want to see a latest horror flick, we can't tell you the name, but just come out to the theater in the valley and we'll we'll check it out. And yeah, you fill out like these intricate scorecards where it's like, how much did you like this character? What stupid. Do do? Yeah. <laughs> in caps. And um, so yeah, we started doing that college, uh, or at community colleges around the area. Yeah, and and it's always painful to do that. It's always painful to open yourself up to criticism, but at the same time, um, we are we always try to be as hard on our work as possible, so um, so we don't get our feelings hurt. I think <laughs> you know, when other people used to say they don't like something that we did. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's always a problem. Yeah, because I think you know we have uh, we have some actors in the audience mm -hmm. right now too, and we have filmmakers, and I and I do think that it's incredibly important to like seek out that constructive criticism and yeah. be open yeah. to it. And now, as you guys have advanced even kind of past from where you were at the beginning, um, do you think like setting that foundation has made you more successful now, being able to accept the criticism and then potentially change with it? Or does it get yeah. does the criticism get more intense? As you go I mean, you learn how to how to deal with it. I mean, I know when we were teenagers, like the first time we got like a real like harsh review of a film, we were like, "What was that? Like, I can't believe they said that." Or they're not thinking straight. Anyway, like you you learn how to ingest that, and either you read beneath the note and figure out what really the person is saying, or you just like. If you go online after you release a movie and you see a bunch of anonymous people like ripping your film to shreds or praising it, like you treat it both the same, where it's like, that's nice, but I'm just gonna focus on the next thing I'm working on and apply whatever lessons I learned from that last movie into the next one. Um, but, I, but definitely like as your, as your career grows and what we've been through, it's, there's always gonna be a lot of noise and a lot of voices like attacking you from all sides. And you just have to like take the, the notes that really ring true to you personally and like with your instinct and and use those going forward and I think that's always the most important thing as a filmmaker and actor like listen to like maintain your own instincts and maintain your own voice but also be open to other collaboration criticisms especially and, and so when uh, what other like for, for some people out here who are making their films um, who would you recommend that they go to to seek criticism from is it audiences is it are they film professors like who are some of the best people to get that feedback from um, wow, I, well, I mean, 
Avi, of course, it's going to be different for every person, but I think peers, that, that's great. I think, um, you know, if you, other people, friends that you know that are pursuing the same endeavors um, can often, uh, you know, offer up great feedback. Yeah, I, just like thinking back on what was super useful for us, um, the Cedar Rapids Film Festival had yeah. uh, this this panel of like critics that they were the ones to like review the films, and then there was after after the film festival, like you could come in on like the Sunday, sit down with three of the critics, and they would tell you like their thoughts on the film, and it was very like honest, and it was kind because there's a difference between really harsh criticism and kind criticism. Um, but I remember like hearing that, and we had two films that year, and they're like, now one of these films is like really, really well shot, and the other one like didn't seem as much, why was that? And we were able to like talk about kind of the process behind that, and I just, I don't know, I hold on to those, those memories very dearly because that was, I think, one of the first times you're like, oh, this is how like great criticism can be conveyed, and you kind of can collaborate with your own audience and bounce things off of them. So. And grow, and, um, and I, I was thinking like from a writing standpoint, there's a, there was, I, I assume they still do this, I'm not entirely sure, but um, uh, Blue Cat screenplay competition, um, you, you submit your script for the contest, but they also offer you back feedback and, and coverage on your script, and I don't know, I, I think any opportunity to, to, to learn about what you're putting out there is, is useful. Mm -hmm. Um, so a, a common question that I, I get asked a lot about um, is the pros and cons of uh, either going to film school and pursuing mm -hmm. an education or jumping right into just getting on set experience. Right. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I'd be interested to get your opinion on that. Like, what do you guys yeah. think? What do you get from both of those? Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I think there's no right or wrong way to go. I think there's been a lot of success stories from either way. From our point of view, we were not film students. Um, because we felt like we were making so many movies outside of class that in many ways that was our film school. And I don't think that there's any substitute for just rolling up your sleeves and, and going to make a film. It, it's, it's gotten, um, you know, it's, it's always hard to make something that's quality, but it's gotten easier and easier in terms of um, technology to, to actually go out and produce something. Um, whether you're a writer or an actor or, or a director or editor, or whatever your skill set is or your passion is, um, getting your hands on the actual yeah. project and going out and making something is... Yeah, from, from our limited knowledge of like film school, like the, the collaborators that um, we've worked with that have gone to film school is the benefit of um, being kind of in a creative uh, collaboration with other people that are kind of at your same level and hopefully you will grow with some of those people. Um, I know that's definitely a benefit that can happen at the right film schools. Um, I also think exposing yourself to other types of filmmaking. Like even though we didn't take uh, film courses at University of Iowa, like production courses, we took film criticism courses and we took like Asian film studies and it just opens up your cinematic library to, to other types of filmmakers and voices that are out there. That's always super useful to, to know. Um, oh, that's, that's awesome. I, uh, so uh, one thing I think is really interesting about um, specifically how you guys work together is the partnership as co-writers and co-directors. And I'm really interested on how that kind of works in the pre-production process and then also uh, on production and on set. So can you guys kind of talk about like your process as you're writing together and then mm -hmm. as you're directing together? Yeah. yeah, so when we're writing, we usually um, we'll brainstorm together, we'll get in the same room together and, and throw ideas back and forth. And, and we independently, like new, like anytime we have an idea, like we have notebooks full, like I've got a notebook like on me right now at all times basically because you never know when a, a, a decent idea is gonna come to you. So we're, we're always jotting ideas down, we'll get into the same room, we'll brainstorm, we'll, we'll throw stuff back and forth. But when we actually write, we have found it's very unproductive to be in the same room. We just kind of, we tend to joke around or screw around. We don't get a lot of work done. So, so what'll happen is like, Scott will go off and, and write some pages. He'll send them to me. I'll be like, cool, this is pretty good, but what if you tried this? And then I'll send that back to him and he'll be like, yeah, it's all right, but you know, maybe we can add in this thing over here. And we just kind of try to keep it hands on the script as we go along. Um, and then from the production standpoint, um, we, we didn't start directing together until like we were 22 or something, I think it was, and 
we quickly learned like um, we wanted to be on the same page about everything. And that kind of catered towards what our visual approach was anyway, because we love filmmakers like David Finch or um, Robert Zemeckis, like people that really control the storytelling through their camera angles and their framing devices. And, and so for us, we were like, okay, we're gonna storyboard everything. And that way we know what the story kind of needs and we're on the same page so that once we get on set, there's no confusion about how the camera should move. And that's not to say once we get on set, we're 100% regimented to what we plan, but it at least gives you a blueprint of kind of your marching orders. Um, and then in terms of like working with the actors and such, like we're 100% like side by side on everything. So if we're running a lot of takes uh, of a scene, um, we just kind of lean over after we cut, quickly have like a shorthand exchange of notes, and then we both go up and deliver those shared notes to the actors. Um, but yeah, we try to get like all of our arguments done like before we get on set or with anybody else in the room. And that goes from like, from the script standpoint to the production standpoint, we, we try to be on the same page. And, and it's, it's proven like politically to be a pretty good asset because anytime we have a disagreement with producers, it's, we feel like we have two votes instead of just one vote. So, so um, you know, we both can make a compelling argument for something that they might not be on board with as hard as we can. Yeah, so it's, it's advantageous in terms of we try to put a lot of thought into everything that we do creatively. The downside of it is we always draft emails together. And so like sending a simple email out takes like three times as long as it should. But yeah, we give each other notes on our emails. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, in the in, in the uh, situation where maybe you guys are presented with a creative difference, uh, since you are friends and, and business partners too, kind of in the same, um, what is that process like dealing with that? Like if we differ on something yeah. creatively, Scott's hard to he he doesn't you can't really get mad at Scott. He doesn't really argue with you, so so he doesn't you know it's <laughs> I don't know. We're, we usually it's just always the best idea wins. It's always about um, sometimes if we're like really not jiving on an idea, we're on two different pages, it's usually whoever ends up being slightly more passionate yeah. about their idea. And we really trust and respect each other's opinions. So at the end of the day, if Scott's really passionate about something that I just don't quite see, I trust that he's probably right about that. So and I think there's other times where like one of us will come to a conclusion and be like, we really think it should be this way, and then like a day or two later, like we can come around because that, it challenges your thought process. That actually happens too often. We're like, we'll be on two different pages. <laughs> we'll both make really compelling arguments for why the other person is wrong, sleep on it, come back the other day, Flip and we flops both entirely. Both, we convince each other to swap, I, and we're like, yeah. oh yeah. That's where you feel like the most lost if you don't really know what the right decision is. So, yeah. There are no right decisions though. It's, yeah. all, it's all kind of a crapshoot, I guess. <laughs> Um, what kind of advice would you give to uh, other partner filmmakers who are kind of wanting to go into it the same way, like any tips or tricks? Yikes, I don't know, because I don't know why it works for us, other I mean, than like... I think it helps that we've known each other for so long. Yeah. We have the same frame of references, not only in terms of life experience and where we grew up, but also in terms of the movies that we love. Yeah. But I would recommend having a writing or directing partner to go through the business with because the business is incredibly lonely and, and disappointing and, and, and depressing at times. So it's really cool yeah. to have somebody fight the fight with you um, rather than alone. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I, I think like if you can find that right person, um, yeah, it's gonna be incredibly beneficial. I think to all the things that we're saying though, where it does challenge you and it challenges that collaboration, but in a very healthy way. Um, but I don't know, like we've, we've also seen like a lot of writing partners that started out together and then they go their separate ways and directing partners too. I mean, even like studio filmmakers that have directed things together and then they go their separate ways. So I, I don't know, I don't know what the, the magic ingredients are. <laughs> um, what do you guys feel like was like your launching off project, the, the, the one that like got you to where you are right now and uh, what aspects of that project do you think made it the success that it was? I mean, it feels like every project we do feels like it takes you somewhere else, but you don't know it until after the fact. You kind of look in your rear view mirror. Because I could say, like, we did this short film um, called Amber um, back in like 2003, 2004, and that placed us in a Project Greenlight competition, which started opening up doors. And then after that, we did a, a feature film called University Heights, which that film we cut into like a trailer and entered into this uh, 
uh, MTV competition that then got us a quote unquote development deal with MTV Films, which you can talk about later when I'm putting them in quotes. Um, and that kind of opened up doors for us. And then, like, I think the one that I always look at is this film called Impulse that we shot here in Iowa back in 2009, which really that was born out of frustration where we had been writing scripts for a few years and not making anything actively. And finally we had enough and we're like, let's just make something. Let's go back to Iowa and shoot something. And so we div devised this idea of a short film and shot it here in Iowa. We finished it in like 2010, played it at a film festival out in LA and through like just friends and connections, we were able to get it in front of a few talent managers. And through that, we were able to find the talent manager that we work with to this day. And that has just kind of opened up a bunch of relationships um, that we probably would have never had had we not decided to make that movie. So I think, to me, that maybe that's the lynch, linchpin, but I don't know, it's, it's all these projects I feel like kind of take you somewhere you don't expect. But for that one specifically, what, um, what do you think, uh, like, what do you think was the specific thing about that project that made it like stand out above and was the one that kind of got you where you needed it to be? Well, when we were making it, we talked a lot about how um, many short films tend to be two people in a room talking, um, which can be terrific. There's nothing against that, but I think you see that a lot just because it's, it's slightly easier to do. Um, so we wanted to make something that would stand out, that felt a little bit bigger in scope and scale. Um, and I don't know, I, other than that, I, I can't say. I think it was also like the added pressure that Okay, so it was a short film, but like we spent a decent amount of money considering it was a short film. Um, I forget the exact budget, but it's like you could buy like a couple of cars with the price that we paid for that. And so there was the pressure of like, if we screw this up, it's kind like of the last shot. Yeah, at making. it's like we can't go back to like our friends and family that are like donating money and resources to this movie and ask them again. So there was that pressure of let's throw everything we can into this and make it like it's only movie we'll ever get to make for the rest of our life. So that might have contributed. To it, so. And I think there was um, a slight shift in mentality when we were gearing up for that of like starting to realize that sometimes our earlier films were more about what we wanted to see and not as much about what an audience might actually want to see. And I think like thinking a little bit more um, about the audience yeah. kind of paying the audience respect. And going back to like, I think the movies that we grew up with loving, which is like Jaws and Back to the Future, and like these movies that are popcorn movies. And so for us, I think, yeah, just transporting ourselves into the role of, um, you know, the viewer, like what, what's fun to watch? Is there a mystery that you want to kind of hang on every single minute of the, the movie? Realizing that we weren't Martin Scorsese and did, did yeah. not know anything <laughs> about gangsters and, um, you know, kill convictions and so forth. So. <laughs> I, I, I liked what you said about like the, the one location, like how a lot of short films are doing that. So that actually leads me to another question. Uh, do you think it's it's better to write like a, a big ambitious piece that like it's going to be like wow, it's going to be awesome, but I know it's going to be a high budget, mm -hmm. or do you think it plays in favor to play it safe and write something practical? Yeah. Somewhere in between, because yeah. I think I think what you want to do is write to your resources, mm -hmm. and you want to you want to play to the things that you like. If you have a family friend who has a warehouse and you know you can shoot there, you should write the warehouse movie. Um, like, you know, we, we always thought about what what did we have access to. Scott's dad had a cool office building that we would shoot at. Um, our um, frequent collaborator, Justin Markson, had um, his dad worked for the Davenport Police Station, so we'd always get police cars. So we would kind of do our best to write around production value. Um, but I do think you want to try to be ambitious and, and get outside your comfort zone. I think yeah, I don't know. It's like, you could have a really fascinating tale of two people talking in a room, if you're, especially if you're Quentin Tarantino. Like, you know, like, <laughs> Glorious Bastards is one of the greatest films of all time for the way you're just sitting in a room and it's about language and about the suspense of what these characters' ul ulterior motives are. So, I don't know, it's like if you can recognize that strength, then you can also use that as the resource. But yeah, I think it's what Brian's saying. It's like we always just kind of leaned into what we knew. And I think on impulse, there was a little more ambition there in terms of like, we have to shut down a city square and we have to get like a Dodge Challenger and convince the, uh, the, the dealership that we're gonna bring it back with no scratches on it, but race at 90 miles per hour. Um, but that was, I think, born out of 
like I was in LA at the time and I knew like you can't do a short film in LA very easily at all. But I know back in Iowa, we always had such a groundswell of support. So I think we can probably pull this off. And you're always crossing your fingers, hoping that it actually works out. But um, again, coming back here and being able to talk to like the dealerships and being able to talk to the city council in Perry, Iowa, where we shot it and be like, we need to close down the city square for one day. Um, you're finding a lot of people that are willing to work with you. And I think that's a, that's a great resource here in Iowa that everybody should take advantage of. Um, so when it comes to like what you guys think makes a film really great, what do you think is the most important aspect? Do you think it is the script, is it cinematography, is it the actors that you cast? Like what do you guys usually want to go for first mm -hmm. pictures? When I when I love a movie, I love it because everything's firing on all cylinders. I love it because the music's amazing, the directing's amazing, the script like I, so like t in a weird way, I think everything is super important. But um, there's no denying that it all starts with a story. Um, so yeah, you've got to have exactly. a compelling yeah. story and a compelling script. And, and that's, that's also the thing that is great, is writing. Yeah, so and I think like the, the, the other thing, though, to think of like story that kind of goes hand in hand is like if you're going to make the story a movie, like you should make it cinematic, too. And that, that's not just like what goes on screen, like that goes into the writing many times. I'm not talking about like you put in like wide shot here, but. It's, is it a story that demands to be told through cinema? Or does it need to be told through just publishing like it online or through a novel? Um, and I think those are the movies that we always kind of grew up with um, and taste-wise kind of flock to. And it's kind of what Brian's saying, like once you get, you fill in all the colors of like the cinematography and the music, it colors the entire pr production. But from the script standpoint, I think there's a way of telling things cinematically and there's ways of not telling it so cinematically too. Um, what are, it, so I know you guys kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but like what are some of the differences between uh, making films in Iowa versus in larger markets such as Los Angeles? I mean, there's no compare. I mean, in LA, it's it's almost impossible. It's very expensive because um, you need permits, it's harder to steal shots. Um, there's a lot of actors in LA, um, so I suppose it's easier to, not easier, but you can wrangle a cast um, because there, there, there is a lot of people out there looking for work, but it's a business, like it's a business in LA, where it's um, in Iowa, not that it's not a business, but just kind of like the general demeanor of making movies here. Like it's exciting, it's fun, and I feel like everyone that we talked to when we were making movies here, like again, like can we get this location? Like, like people are interested in that, and it's not just like you go out to LA and you're like, oh, I really like this location, can I shoot here? And you're like, yes, that's gonna be $5,000, please. Yeah, so, <laughs> that city has figured out a way, how, it, it's like genius how they know how to take every penny out of your pocket. Like, they've just like, <laughs> like mathematically figured out the science. It's, it's, I mean, you it's, cannot it's shoot anything, like if you have a tripod and you have a camera on that, if a cop comes by, which they will, they'll be like, no, you need a permit if you have a tripod. So you can't even like, even a dinky camera, you cannot shoot something back there without being hassled. Um, so I don't know, that's that's the main difference there. And then I think the excitement level is also different because I've, there's so many people out there that are working on movies and um, you know that's fine because that's a job, but there's just not that like instinctual passion that, that is always burning in people, you know, from, from the actors down to the grips and such. So there you go. But yeah, and, and that's what I've heard too, is it becomes more just kind of a job. It's just yeah. your nine to five and not necessarily yeah quite the passion side of it. Um, what would you say is like kind of the difference um, on like working with crews uh, in Iowa versus like in LA? Like is it better having people who maybe have more experience and you have more toys to play with in, a, in an environment like Los Angeles or is it better to just make things work here? And to well, it, it's, um, it's a bit of a trade off, but honestly like our experiences here on some of our bigger stuff with, with the crews um, at work and it, making like like a film like Impulse or the, the MTV pilot that we brought back here and shot in Iowa City um, didn't feel it didn't feel that different than um, no. you know, making Nightlight or doing other stuff that we've done in LA. I think in LA there is a lot more experience and that is and there is a lot more um, numbers to pull from. But uh, I don't know. Sometimes it's it's better to have the enthusiasm and excitement. Yeah. Um, what are uh, what are some uh, big mistakes that you think uh, beginning filmmakers make, and uh, what are some things that can be 
that are some resources available to help them improve in this? I think the first mistake is thinking your film is great. Like, if you think, oh yeah, that's our opinion. It's like, if we're ever happy with something, we're like, then we really screwed it up. Um, and I guess that's just like, that just goes back to, um, like, I think the biggest mistake is that you have nothing left to learn. And I feel that, I hope I continue feeling that way like 50 years from now, if I'm still alive, um, that I'm like, I still need to learn how to make films better. And so I don't know. I think that's that's one pitfall. I don't know what else. What else have I'm we? I'm just seen? trying to. Yeah, I'm trying to think of all the mistakes we've made over the years. I mean, there's plenty. There are plenty. Like we um, we just screened uh, Impulse last night in Davenport, uh, and we haven't seen it for like a few years. And we're watching that. And we're just like, oh, this is terrible. That's terrible. Everything's terrible. And I think that just hopefully comes from like you get a different perspective when you go back and watch your work. I think that's always like you should have your antennas up and be receptive to how you can change. Another another mistake, this is more on the business side of things, so tell me if this is not compelling, but another mistake I think young filmmakers make, and, and certainly it's easy to fall into this pitfall, is thinking that um, like, oh, if only I had um, if only I had Steven Spielberg's agent, yeah. I could, you know, propel my professional career forward. And what you start to realize, what we started to realize early on is you you don't reach for the people higher than you. You reach for the people at your level, mm -hmm. and you grow with them. So rather than trying to land you know, the biggest agent at CAA or the biggest producer, like you want to find the next. You want to find a guy who's going to be there you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now right. um, when you're at that level also. Yeah that's, um, yeah, that's a good point, because I think for the longest time, like in that gap before we made Impulse, we were writing. I, again, I was out in LA, I think, for like a year or two, and we were just aiming on writing scripts that were like these huge tent poles and such. And there's two mistakes actually now that I'm thinking of by this. Um, we wrote one script that would have cost like a hundred million dollars, and and like we're two guys that had no produce credits whatsoever, and we were trying to figure out like, well, if just the right person reads this, they're gonna love it. You know, it's $100 million, but it's going to be a great movie, and if it's not, we're willing to put our careers on the line, and we'll, we'll never make a movie again. But it's like, you have no careers to, to lose, first and foremost. Um, but we made the mistake of writing something that can't be produced. And that's not to say you shouldn't, like, have giant ambitions, but I think, like, especially in forming a career, like, it's super helpful to write things that you can figure out how to do on a small level, or if you can get, like, big talent attached, like it can be produced on a bigger level, but it's kind of that scalable production level. Um, the other mistake, going back to kind of what Brian was saying about agents and such, is like there was a there was a time where we were writing these scripts and aiming to like try to get an agent, land an agent with that. And our focus, I think, was so heavily on that where really the idea should have been like, just focus on the work. Like, and that's not to say there weren't, but it was like we were, Spending too much time trying to like chase that like there was a agency. there was a week where we had a meeting. We were pretty young. I don't remember, how we were, but we had a meeting at um, CAA, ICM, and uh, Gersh. Gersh agency, all agencies, and and we took these meetings and they they would like you'd sit down with the agents and they'd be like, you guys are going to be the next big thing, and like you, you'll be amazed at how quickly this is all going to happen, and they basically tell you everything you've ever wanted to hear. And then a week later, they all passed on us. Yeah, by the way, when <laughs> they like, said that, they had not read our scripts either yeah. yet. So and then they like, read our scripts, service. and they're like, never mind. <laughs> like, and that same week, we um, we also had like applied to the Sundance Screenwriters Lab with a certain script, and then the uh, Nichols Fellowship. And all those things like collapsed in one week, where it was like, no, you're not going to get signed. No, you're not going to uh, place any of these competitions to get your film moving forward. And for us, that was really soul crushing at the time, but then quickly we were like, okay, well it didn't work on that, so what's the next project that we can do? And I think that's where we started learning the lesson, like just focus on writing something that could be produced and also that, just focus on that work, just completely laser focus. The whole business is just <laughs> failing upwards. Like the whole business is just pure rejection and it never stops. And at any time we've been like even somewhat successful like there's a story behind the success of like what could have been and like why this isn't good enough and like the things that fell through before that and 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 how um, 
rejection sometimes leads to other opportunities, and um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, jumping back a little bit, um, it, when you guys wrote A Quiet Place, that was intended to be a low-budget film, mm -hmm. and then now that it's getting the, the, the support from Paramount Pictures and Michael Bay, it's obviously going to be a larger film, mm -hmm. you know? So it can, it can work kind of backwards like that. Totally. So, yeah. Well, we always, we always write with, like, scalability in mind, so it's, it wasn't so much that it was written to be a low-budget film, it was, it was that, in the back of our minds, we're like, worst-case scenario. We're gonna bring this thing back to Iowa. We're gonna shoot it for a hundred thousand dollars. Like we just like we knew like there was a scalability. We could do it for that if we had to. Um, and I think that that's what we always try to do. And, and probably maybe decent advice is um, is to be creating projects that um, you could make yourself if um, if it doesn't. And, and that being said, like you don't have to limit like the world of the film either. Like you could write a version of The Matrix that that just takes place in the real world, but still is as thought provoking and, and incredible as that movie. Um, so it's not a limitation creatively. It's just like it's it's challenging you to recontextualize like your approach to the story. I think in production scale. And and I think what you find too with producers is like they're always looking at scripts for like, can we make this? Is this a real movie? Is this something that can actually be, I can put together, I can, you know, I can put this actor in it, do this, that, actually put yeah. together a production. It's not like, you know, studios want to spend like, you know, 100, 200 million dollars, especially on an original idea, right. um, too, because they're only doing that on like the big temple movies that we all know, all the superhero movies that we're inundated with. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I think that's definitely like something we learned early on is, is try to figure out but, and that helped because we had a direct, we were directors too. So like we put on our director's hat and we are like, okay, how can we actually write this so that we can kind of make it into a movie no matter what the scale. Um, from a writer's perspective, how often do you guys think uh, people need to be writing in order to improve their craft? Um, I think, wow. I laugh because I feel like every writer will be like every day, but then yeah, like, did you just you flash to like playing Xbox? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and I take solace in knowing like other like screenwriters do that too, but that is not advice you should take home at all. Like, I don't know. Like, you should write when you're. Um, I, w I would say like when you're inspired, definitely. But it's like inspiration doesn't come that often. <laughs> I mean, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it, I'm torn because I agree. Like, you can when you when you're inspired and you're feeling it, like it's always great to, to put the work in. Um, but at the same time, inspiration doesn't usually just come. So sometimes you have to force yourself a little bit. There's um like I've been trying to apply this. I think it was like Elon Musk or something um, was saying like just spend five minutes like starting something, and then you know an hour later you'll figure out oh I've been writing for like an hour so I've been trying to apply that where it's like okay five minutes without checking my emails or Facebook or Twitter or anything and just sit down and do the work and many times like that that succeeds so I think that um, that's a lesson that I've learned that I think has worked for me and may work for other people is just sit down for five minutes and start writing because you're not always going to find like the muse on the page and it's, it's really rare but don't, but don't be hard on yourself if you played a little Xbox or yeah, you, know, yeah, you had to take true. a day off, you know. I, I, I think a lot of writers do, like, you know, it, it, sometimes it's just not happening. And the, best, weird, the best writing is when you're not at the keyboard, too. Because you can't just, like, be like, okay, I need to write, and you sit down at the keyboard, and the page is blank, and force it out. Like, 90% like of writing, I think, for us is when you're not sitting down there, and you're just you're jotting down notes in your notebook, or if you're like in, like in the shower, I, I hear this from many people and it works for me, like if you're in the shower all of a sudden like things unlock in your head and you're like, oh, now that combines to this and that. So, and I, yeah. I love like watching movies or reading scripts to get inspired too. Mm -hmm. um, that, that really helps me get in the zone and, and feel it. Mm -hmm. And uh, like they, having each other too, do you guys like hold each other a little bit accountable? Like you're like, hey, you're like, <laughs> we should do better at that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we do, and I think um, at least I feel like if I need to deliver a certain a certain amount of script pages, like by the end of the day, so that Brian can read and then he can do his pass, like that does hold us accountable to a deadline. And that's not to say like we always hit that, but by the end of the day, we're talking about like, okay, here's what's been accomplished here's where we need to go forward and hopefully come to terms with kind of what the balance is. And we do usually like throw some dates down on a calendar, mm -hmm. like we'll be like, in, in two weeks we need to have that first draft done. And we, 
we're not we're not hard on ourselves if we're a few days late or whatever, but mm -hmm. it's good to have those milestones and, and check in with each other and make sure we're on track. And at some point, like the produce, like on some of these projects, like the producers are really expecting like deadlines to be hit by you know X Y Z, and and so that really like lights the fire underneath you, <laughs> and, and you have to figure out like how to work backwards to, to hit that deadline. Um, you know, I think one struggle that a lot of uh, Iowa filmmakers and actors have is uh, like, when is the right time for me to expand into a larger market? You know, uh, when for the both of you did you know like it was time to leave? Um, I don't know. Like, I feel like in high school I always thought like, oh, I'll go out to LA. But I think that was just because I knew that's where the film industry like really was booming. So it was kind of this pre preconceived notion in my head. And I don't know, my, my personal story is that my wife, um, before we were married, she was a year older than me, and she moved out to LA knowing like I'd probably head out there. So after I graduated, I was like, well, if I, I wanna stay in this relationship, I better head out to LA. Um, and, and luckily that worked out. Um, but I don't know, like my heart still belongs to Iowa, still belongs to Iowa. And so I think that we were really torn about do we need to leave Iowa behind in order to make it? And I think like the a long story short, like we found it beneficial if only because there are connections to be made. But at the same time, like since we've left, like technology has become so incredible, and you can start a career from many different places, and, and you can make movies with such great technology in your backyard. So I don't know, like if I were in that position today, if it would be such an easy conundrum, but. I don't know, it's it's hard to really um, to pin down advice for actors because we've seen that a lot where like actors want to expand in other markets and it's it's hard, LA is far away. Um, what's great though about Iowa is you are close to Chicago. So if you want to dip your feet into like what they have there, which they have tons of TV shows now, they have um, a lot of commercials being shot there and a lot of independent films, um, you can kind of get a taste of it and see kind of how that works out for you. There's certain people that we know that have made their careers now working out in the Midwest and don't have to go to like the coast at all. I, I would say though, like when you eventually kind of move out to LA, um, it takes a while. Like it's not like something like I don't think you can just go out there for a year and be like, I'm going to give it a try and, and see how it goes. I think you it, it takes a long time to build up a network and and kind of force your your way into the, the system because it's a long line. There's a lot of people. I will say islands are really, really cool though. They are. And um, like when I cool when I graduated, I immediately went to the online um, University of Iowa alumni network, and I just looked up like who works in film and graduated from Iowa because I always feel like there's that Iowa goodwill like synergy, and I reached out to um, several people. Uh, one is Nick Meyer who um, did Star Trek VI, a prolific writer and director. And I just like cold queried him. I'm like, look, I'm this you know lowly kid from Iowa, and I just I don't know what LA is going to be like. I'm wondering if um, you know you had any advice. And and I was shocked when he emailed me back. And even more shocked where he's like, yeah, just come over to my house and we'll just like shoot the shit and <laughs> and hang out. And it was I don't know. It's like I really really value looking back on like the people that just kind of open your doors. Like even if nothing ever came of it, it would just felt more like home. As soon as you start start finding these other people in the film industry, and especially Iowans too. Um, this, uh, can you guys speak a little bit about the process of getting agent representation in Los Angeles? I know we talked about it a little bit, but like kind of how that whole mm -hmm. process works, and then right. how that gets you get your script to a, a producer. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So the probably the, the best way to really the only way that an, an agent. I mean, maybe we should talk like we should start with managing. Because usually managers, that's the way the, the paradigm is now in the system. It's like you kind of get a manager first, and then your manager helps you get an agent. And to clarify, like the difference between managers and agents, in case there in case people not. don't know, <laughs> <laughs> manager like the the boring answer is managers are not licensed to like negotiate on behalf of agents. So um, so there's that. But but managers also are approaching um, your work as a career. Not like a script sale here, a script sale there. Like I'll call you once the this, this script's ready to go. Managers are really concerned with the day to day and week to week of a career, so they're much more focused on making sure you're set up for you know longevity 
And I think that's, again, the greatest first step that, that a writer or director can make. So, so the process is either, there's really only so many ways to get in touch with the manager. It's basically like cold querying them um, or cold calling them and, and being like, hey, will you read my script? And they'll more often than not be like, no, I don't know you and that's not how we do this. So, um, so usually like the way to get to a manager is by a referral. So um, what we did was we made that short film that got the attention of some people at a film festival who were producers or assistants and worked at various companies um, in the business and they referred us to the manager. They said, that, you know, like they would email um, different managers and be like, you gotta see this film, it's really cool. Um, and that can happen for a script too. So that's why, that is the importance of, of being in LA is building that network, is um, meeting people um, in the business who read your work or watch your work and become fans of it and then share it with other people. That's that's basically how it happens. So like if somebody had a script um, in the audience and, and they sent it to us, and we're slow readers, so we probably wouldn't read it for a while because we're awful, but um, and if we really dug it, you know, we'd be happy to send it to a manager or agent and, and be like, oh, you gotta check this out, it's really cool. So that, that's the process. Um, and then agents usually come by way of referral from managers. Yeah, like our, our personal process for um, getting an agent was, like, again, we tried so hard for so many years and nothing happened. And then um, we had written this script called Nightlight and we just wrote it again with the idea like, let's write something that we could produce, worst case scenario, like we'll, we'll do it for like no money whatsoever. And we wrote that and had actually, um, our manager took it out and sold it to a production company and based on that being sold, then like agency started like calling us. And that's kind of the best way for it to work where you're not trying to knock down their door, it's it's them calling you. So again, that, that kind of was a long-term domino effect of making something so that you could attract, you know, interest and then getting the manager that kind of was, was really helping build a career. So, so previous to getting a, a manager or an agent, it really comes up to like you as the filmmaker, like pitching your idea. Um, what do you guys feel like uh, sets you up for a successful pitch and what can set you up for a not very successful pitch? Yeah, I feel like we're the worst guys to ask about pitching because we're terrible at pitching it. Pitching is real. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they make writers pitch because it's co a completely different skill set. Um, it feels like acting usually, um, especially television pitching. Which is, anyway, but I mean, um, obviously, there's there's a hook. Like you all hear, like you know, the ten second like elevator pitch or whatever. And so there's certainly a hook aspect about it. Um, that being said, there's some movies that would sound terrible in ten seconds, and they just don't do it justice. So so I think the pitch is fine, but. But I don't know, again, like focus on the material itself. Like usually most people, even if the pitch is like a little iffy, like you'll read the first couple pages and based on those two pages, like you can tell almost everything about what the script is going to be from there on out. You can tell like, is there a voice here? Is there a story that's being told? Is there a character that's intriguing? And so to me, it's like those first two pages are more important than like really unlocking the best pitch. I, I just was thinking of how um, we, I, I won't name any names, but we kind of off the cuff loosely pitched A Quiet Place to um, a couple executives uh, over lunch, and they, uh, studio executives, and they passed <laughs> based on our like rambling through this <laughs> cool idea we thought we had, and they're like, oh yeah, that sounds nice, I don't know if that's for us. And then like, you know, when they eventually read the script, they, they, it ended up uh, selling very quickly, but, um, yeah, I think Scott's right. Materials is more important than um, who you are, how you carry yourself. But um, I think managers all like to all like to hear a unique kind of personal story, like what sets you apart, what what makes you um, interesting um, in terms of your life, and then also, you know, what are your they're always going to want to know what are your favorite films and like what filmmakers do you study and, and what writers do you like and, and how does that kind of fit. Um, so before we get into the, uh, the audience questions, I'm going to ask uh, one last here, and this is an age-old goodie. Uh, if you could go back and do it all over again, what would you change? Hmm. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I wouldn't want to go back. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know. Like, I wouldn't change anything because I feel like um, 
in retrospect, again, like everything kind of led to something else, and it's like it feels strangely like that's how it just meant it was meant to be. Um, and all our failures, and again, like everything I think we've done is a failure, it feels like, in a really weird way. Um, like you just learn so much from that, and you grow as a person, and not just as a filmmaker, but like as a human being. And I think those are the most vital experiences in retrospect that we have. So I don't know, I, I wouldn't want to go back and redo it, and I don't think we would redo anything differently necessarily. It's just like you embrace every opportunity you have and make the best out of it, whether it's a, a huge success or failure. All right, and with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up to the audience, and if you guys don't have questions, I still got more, so no pressure. <laughs> who do you use for copyright? Uh, for I copyright. Know, a lot of them, right? I mean, who do you recommend? Yeah, um, we always just did, like, the U.S. copyright. Um, you, you can do WGA. WGA isn't really as important unless you're in the Writers Guild, um, in which case there's a whole whole different like piece of arbitration that you go through. But yeah, US copyright is usually solid. Yeah, uh, could you just go back to, um, I think something you started to allude to and just talk briefly about um, the positives and negatives of that uh, development experience that you had with MTV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. probably have to walk carefully on this one, but I mean, the, it, it was a competition we won, so the development deal was, um, it, we put it in quotes because it never quite felt real, but we always kind of tried to, like, we kind of spun it as if it was real because it, it, uh, it, um, it, it did open a few doors for us um, in terms of like managers and producers and so forth, but it was basically, um, we negotiated that contract for well, we were, okay, to put it in context, like, we were, like, 21 years old, still in college, and it's, like, Hollywood doesn't care about you, <laughs> and so when we're, like, we keep, like, emailing, like, the MTV attorneys and being, like, what's going on with this, it's, like, yeah, 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 we'll get, we'll get it, we'll get the contract out to you, and, of course, like, six months later, it's, like, hey, we're still over here, <laughs> where's that contract, so it just was, um, it was, like, a really long process, and over the, the course of it, of that negotiation, MTV Films actually was dissolved as a production entity. Um, it was a part of Paramount Pictures and they decided like, oh, we're gonna dissolve like a bunch of these um, different smaller companies underneath our umbrella, but we're going to just keep them as labels. So there's just like the vanity label of MTV Films. And so we kind of saw like our development deal itself dissolving before our eyes. And so the one thing that we made sure to do um, was David Gale, who was the president of MTV Films at the time, um, we just made sure to make contact with him and um, pitch him lots of cool ideas. And, and, he, and, and this guy was responsible for like the creation of um, Mike Judge's career, who, who has gone on to do King of the Hill, be as a butthead, um, Office Space, and he also launched um, like Craig Brewer, who did Hustle and Flow, and uh, Louis C.K. He produced Louis C.K.'s first movie. And so we saw this guy as being like, He's a tastemaker, and we could learn a lot from him if we were kind of shepherded. By and so, and he became a mentor of sorts for us, and he helped us um, put together our pilot presentation for MTV that we that we brought back here. So it was, um, I guess, on some level, it was kind of like a failure that we tried to spin into a positive. But I think we we like with David, it wasn't like they were like, oh, hey, you should you guys should meet David. We just had done our own research, and we're like, oh, David's leaving MTV Films. He's doing this other like label at MTV, can we just talk to him? Can we get a meeting? So, um, you know, certainly that's that's a piece of advice, like to do research on kind of like these different opportunities you can. And, you know, you'll probably get doors closed on you nine times out of 10, but that one time, like you might be able to, to kind of find uh, a really great mentor or collaborator out of that. Yeah, question. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh It's, um, it's not so much like taking something big and then shrinking it. Um, it's more about just finding a, a premise that is contained in a way that, uh, that, that can be scaled bigger. Um, I'm 
trying to think of an example. I mean, Quiet Place is a great example, but I can't, we can't say anything about that one quite yet. Um, I mean, Nightlight, this movie we did called Nightlight was kind of an example of that. It was um, basically written in the heyday of found footage of like Paranormal Activity and, and Blair Witch and these kind of like found footage movies. And uh, we came up with an idea to do something like that, but through the prism of like a flashlight was our weird idea. It was like, we wanted to shoot an entire movie from the point of view of a flashlight. I don't know, I'm like, now I'm like, regrets. Like, maybe we should, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know if we need to do a whole movie from the point of view of a flashlight, but, um, but like, we thought that, that that concept would be something that was contained and scalable, that we could, worst case scenario, we we're always thinking worst case scenario, we could come back to Iowa and, and shoot it with our friends, um, and then best case scenario, it would be a slightly bigger movie, which it ended up being. So it was kind of something that <laughs> it's never so perfect. You have to have that thing locked in. Yeah. Or is there a concept that people latch on to and that they can be developed? Yeah, that's interesting. Because um, I feel like we've, um, a lot of times, just like for, for either rewrite jobs or like as directors, like we read different scripts um, to consider to come on board. And we've seen a lot of scripts where. The, like there's a concept there, but the execution isn't there. So sometimes that's the case. Um, I don't like it. It's to us like a script is never perfect. That's our approach to it. But I, I know what you're saying in terms of like when is it ready. And the point is you don't really know, and at some point you have to like just take the leap. But just make sure that you're you're happy with it and you can defend it as much as possible. Um, like David Fincher always talks about in the production. In, from a production standpoint, like movies are never finished. They're just released into the wild. And it's like there's some day where you finally have to write the end on a script and just commit to it. So. And commit to moving forward. If yeah. it doesn't go anywhere, people don't like it, you're already on to the next one, I think is, is how we've always approached it. But I do think when you're a new writer, or not, not new writer, that's the wrong word, but like a spec script, um, as you phrased it, spec script, I do think the more dialed in and polished, the better, because people, they, everyone's job in Hollywood, um, we started to realize, is their job is to say no. That's, they are hired to pass on everything. They don't want to make movies, because most companies can only afford to make two or three movies a year at most, so um, any reason they have to, to put the script down, they'll, they'll take, so that's as perfect as possible. Yeah. Um, you always talk about best case scenario and worst case scenario. <laughs> and um, and now that you've got kind of a taste of the best case scenario, uh, is video on demand and the new distribution paradigms that are seem to be developing affecting your view as far as mm. what you're writing for and what you're going to do in the future? That's a great question. I mean, I don't know that it's affecting per so much our process or what we're like looking to write, but there is something to be said for like, I, I feel like there used to be a stigma on on demand and like VOD and, and watching stuff at home and, and clearly um, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and all these other uh, exhibi exhibition models have kind of shown that um, that's a big deal and and a lot of people a lot of people watch Stranger Things on Netflix and it didn't matter and granted it's a TV show but it didn't matter that it that it didn't open in theaters um, people are watching stuff at home. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I think for us, um, like you never know, like when you write a script, you don't know where the best home really is going to be for it. I mean, I think like us personally, um, especially coming from the, the film background and loving like big screen theatrical experiences, like that's what we're always writing for. But that's not to say if like we wrote something and uh, Netflix is really interested in it that we would, you know, not be interested in that collaboration because there's a, it's kind of like the Wild West in terms of you know companies like Netflix or Amazon or Hulu not really being as hands-on as some of the larger studios are. And part of that is a simple financial thing where like studios have to dump um, as much money into the marketing as they spend on making the actual movie sometimes. Whereas Netflix, if you have a Netflix subscription, they know that they're targeting immediately like millions and millions of people around the world. You don't have to spend that much in marketing. 
So again, that affects the creative in terms of like, sometimes they're not as hands-on and that can be a really exciting space to work in. So I think, you know, we're encouraged by it. I wouldn't say we're writing things for like a specific market, but you know, once things sell or get set up, we're definitely open to different places. It's amazing how much crossover there is right now in terms of television and film. Um, I, I know this isn't quite what you're asking, but it just made me think that um, a lot of, we're, we're approached more often than not um, now by television companies who are looking for feature film writers and filmmakers um, because it's just it's all becoming kind of one thing. It's not like the movies used to be you go to a movie theater and you watch a film projected on 35 millimeter and now it's just it's all just kind of content. It's all kind of becoming one thing. So I think that's exciting. I think it's an exciting time to be working. Yeah. Can you tell us about uh, some of the challenges you face, your creators, and some of the challenges you face on the business and legal side <laughs> that you have to learn or overcome that you can tell us about? Yeah, I mean, I think um, first and foremost, like, um, always be your best advocate. Like, I, I think a lot of times we were um, sitting around being like, oh, this person will take care of that, this person will take care of that, and um, clearly on the, the development deal, like, we had, we had a lot of helpful, like, legal advisors on that. But certainly, like, you are going to be looking out for your best interests, and you can never guarantee that with anybody else. Or maybe I'm just paranoid, I don't know. Um, but I don't know, like, at, at, at some point, like, in, in our careers, I think there was a trust where it's like, between your agent, your manager, and your attorney, they're going to f try and fight for the best deal, and they'll come back to you, and you know whether or not that's, that's the best for you. And you just have to have peace of mind to move forward, I think, at a certain point. And it, and it does help to educate yourself on some of like the legalese or the, the boilerplate like deals that are usually made for writers or directors or producers or for an entire production entity, um, simply because that, that's going to inform you better as, as a person and negotiator. Um, there's also a whole another aspect of the business where you also have to deal with LLCs and S corporations and things that would probably put you to sleep if we went into it. But that's something at a, at a certain point, like you want to inform yourself because that's going to affect um, a, a lot of financials too. So. Yeah, question over there. Um, on the other side of uh, what, what, would, what would make a, a act more market? I mean, it's, I guess to speak to us, and, and to a certain point, like casting directors, I mean, just um, a natural presence. Like, I think, like, if someone puts on a facade, like, you can see that, um, see through that immediately. Um, I don't know. Yeah, and I also think people are always looking for what makes you unique. Like, what is going to make you stand out amongst the crowd? I think that's what it's about. And sometimes, like that, like, it's it's hard to take that as an actor. Like I, I am glad I'm not an actor because that is a really, really challenging um, career to be in, and you face more rejection than I think we face just because you're auditioning all the time. Um, but when it's right, it's right, and when you fit for a role, you fit for a role, and you can never guarantee that yourself. It's kind of at the whim of like the director or the casting directors, and sometimes. You're perfect for the role, but they already cast this other person, and the chemistry is just not there. Um, so, I guess that's all to say. Like, there's a peace of mind that I feel like I hope that actors have is that you know, do your work, but don't get hung up on any, anything specifically. Just go out there and try to do your best, and know that at the end of the day, that's that's what you can do. That's what you bring into an audition room, and anything else you can, is out of your hands. You can't. Uh, yeah, question I have is that um, when your script is picked up by you know, a major studio or a production company, uh, does it undergo any changes at all? Yeah. Yeah, usually. Yeah, almost always. Um, and in fact, it's very common in, in, on the studio side of things, they hire and fire writers over and over and over and over and over. Um, and then sometimes like you'll get fired and then they'll hire like 10 writers and then they'll hire you back the stuff that the other kind of writers did. So um, it, it's very common for, for stuff to go through a lot of changes. 
And also, if you're if you're um, just a writer on a project and like there's a director on board, like that director is inevitably going to bring their own vision to the project. And a lot of times, that can be a very fruitful and rewarding um, conversation because they're going to figure out visually how this is going to be told. And sometimes that can elevate the script to be even better than than what you imagined. But but a yeah, lot, a lot of writers um, when they get to a certain point in their career, they they try to um, become executive producers on the projects that they write as well, because it just gives you a little bit more protection because you're more involved with the producers and filmmakers as they move forward, and, and that helps protect your baby, essentially. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and then far back. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I was at the University of Iowa, and you guys were there. Oh, awesome. And so I, I just always remember you guys just putting in work and like always having a new project, and we've seen each other more than once or twice, but We've, we uh, probably should have been studying for our classes. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I guess my question is, you a lot of completed work, films, short films, that sort of thing. What are your thoughts and what are the thoughts on people kind of in the industry as far as getting noticed with like a proof of concept? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to make, you, you talk about scale yeah, and sure. making, you know, a small scale version of a larger yeah. project. What, how does I yeah, think that's so I think that's viable. So I think people get noticed all the time by doing a proof of concept. The the thing I would stress about anything like people, producers, agents, whoever, the shortest attention spans of all time. So like like thinking about like again like going back to mistakes we made like our um, our short impulse that we were trying to use as a calling card and, and we're able to luckily, but it's it's twenty minutes long. Like no one's gonna sit through that. Like two minutes, you know, maybe. So like something shorter is, is, is better than longer, but I do think that um, movies are still being made with proof of concepts. Um, like yeah, you look at Lights Out stuff. is a recent example. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna butcher his name, but Fetty Al Alvarez, who did, uh, did Panic, what was that called? Panic yeah. Attack or something, and he went on to do the Evil Dead remake and then Don't Breathe. Um, I, think, I think people, per <laughs> I think people prefer watching a two-minute like proof of concept than having to read a ninety-page script. Honestly, so I don't know. I think it's viable. Were you a film student? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. I, yeah. We, that, I, I, I just remember you guys uh, doing so much stuff outside of class, and I was like, that, that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should talk afterwards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It would uh, be nice to catch up. Yeah. Curiosity from the spark of a concept all the way through to distribution. What what part of the process do each of you like the most, get amped up about the most, mm -hmm. and what do you hate the most? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question. I love getting excited about an idea and writing the first ten pages. Yeah, it's all downhill. And, 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 <laughs> and then like sometimes you'll get so excited. You'll start like like I think we have probably like four projects right now that have ten pages like the first ten pages and then nothing else because it, 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 it that's where it gets hard. Um, and I love editing. I love like getting when you um, shoot something and you start putting the pieces together and seeing it come alive. I think it's really cool. the first part of each part of the process. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because I think about like your shooting movie. It's like the first day. It's electrifying, and then like the second day, you're like, ah, oh, we got thirty more days of this, and then. <laughs> Post-production, it's like, yeah, we get to start putting this together, and then you watch the first cut, you're like, everything's terrible, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> um, but that's, that all being said, like, you kind of have to appreciate the peaks and the valleys, too. Like, that's kind of the process of making movies. Like, it's, it's sometimes the best thing in the world, and other times it does feel like a job. And you just kind of have to find that balance, I think, to maintain your own personal balance, too. And, and know that um, even though it's like, it's a dream job, and it's really fun, it's really exciting. Like, there's other days where it's it's just like clocking in, and you just have to maintain some sort of focus to, to get through that. Yeah, when we, um, like on the professional level, we realize, like you start getting notes from, from your producers, and it does suck a little of the fun out. Um, but we, we fought really hard on Nightlight to be the editors, because we had edited all of our work up until that point. We're like, we'll be the editors, and like we'll have more control over our vision, and we immediately realize, like, wait, like, we're hired as the editor, so we have to edit all the stuff the producers want us to edit. So we have to do, like, all their versions of the scenes and, and 
it's like, oh, this isn't just a job. Like, why did we, why did we sign up for this? So, I don't know. somebody kind of it, like no everybody loves finding a, a cool script or a cool short and sharing it with people and, and, and giving advice and helping and um, certainly David Gale is a mentor for us we've had several others along the way mm -hmm. people that we um, call up and ask advice and, and um, I think like for us it's always um, like there's David Gale, but then there's just like other collaborators that we surround ourselves with. So it's not like the traditional like mentoring, like somebody that's seasoned and, and been in it, but to be able to like bounce ideas off, um, like there's other filmmaker collaborators that we have, that we haven't like made projects with, but we always kind of bounce the scripts or ideas off of, and that's, that's incredibly helpful too. Yeah. Sort of to build off of what we were just talking about, um, something I heard at Get yourself in, a, in a, an entertainment lawyer, mm -hmm. um, and while you're like in lieu of, or while you're waiting to find that manager or find that person who's going to mm -hmm. help shepherd your career along, um, what can you comment on? What your thoughts are? Like, well, we're lots of LA, and if you don't have contacts that can put you together with a manager potentially, maybe you have some of these same contacts that could recommend an entertainment lawyer who could also perhaps open some of these doors or shepherd your career along as someone who you may have, you know, a, you know, you can grow with with them as you guys were talking about earlier. Can you comment on that? Do you think that's a good idea to just go out, find someone, put them on retainer for potentially for the year and just like take your chances that way as opposed to being discovered by your work while you're waiting for that to happen? I like I, I don't know the specific circumstance. I'm always skeptical of like if I have to spend money to get somebody to make me connections. Um, and I say that just from a standpoint where that that has gone south a lot of times. That being said, like if if this if there's an attorney or something that you know personally or that you really are getting along with, or maybe they're interested in coming on as like a producer, a passive producer, judge that situation like as it is specifically. Um, our just in our experience, like attorneys um, take 5% of what you earn. So if there is somebody that is willing to be like, okay, we'll, we'll try to get this project together and I'll take 5% once all is said and done, like then you have nothing to lose. And, and uh, oftentimes the entertainment attorneys do have a lot of connections and people uh, do listen to them when they say, check this out, yeah. or, I need this person. Like the first encounter we had with an entertainment attorney um, was when we had the development deal with MTV. So we already had the deal in hand and they were the ones that were like, okay, now that that's in hand, we'll negotiate that. And through that, um, he was the guy that made us our first introductions to agencies. And um, even though we didn't sign with anybody, like they are, they are useful in terms of making referrals as long as um, you know there's that synergy between you two and they believe in you and you believe in them. Yeah. So now that you've, what, what's next for you guys after you've got this sold, what's so, what do you see as the next step? Um, so, um, Quiet Place shoots in September, and then we're directing a movie in October from a script that we wrote called Haunt that um, Eli Roth is producing. Um, and after that, we have a, uh, we have a deal with Paramount, so we'll be writing and directing something for them. Yeah, and we're doing like, we're doing a rewrite right now, so, um, and then there's a couple things like on the horizon we can't really say too much about, but it's all in the, um, the interest in juggling like multiple things at once, because um, like the truth is, and our fear is like, you always have so many things fall apart uh, at, a, at a certain point that you need to juggle several balls at once. At least that's how it works for us, and so we, we know like maybe this one will go through this year, but you never know. It, yeah, it, that's our philosophy is it's so hard to get a movie made, better to have more irons in the fire as possible. We um, we spent a year developing this uh, studio movie 
that we were going to direct, and it was a passion project, and we put everything into it. And um, at the end of that year, the studio was like, all right, cool, um, we're gonna make this movie. Uh, all we have to do is get Chris Pratt to be in it. And we're like, Chris Pratt's not gonna be in our movie. Like, he doesn't, like, he, he can work with Spielberg. He can work with anyone. And, and the movie kind of, it, it kind of fell apart. So we're, we are trying to stay as busy as possible and have many uh, projects percolating. Yes. Did you mentor anybody? Of course, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I don't know if we'd be any good at it, but. <laughs> Your new screenplay is going to be directed by someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it like hard for you to uh, convince? It's miserable. <laughs> <laughs> to convince no, uh, city executives that you want to direct your own uh, screenplay, and from uh, like a beginner filmmaker point of view, right. is it hard on how to convince them? Uh, it's not hard convince? when they say it's going to be released April 2018, and all of a sudden, like the movie starts happening. Like I think, um, like that was the case on Quiet Place, where you know, it's hard to get original movies through the system, um, let alone released by, by studios. And especially like Paramount, you look at their slate, like um, it's, it's mostly franchise films or pre-existing IP. And so I think what, what we kind of found is the idea that you're going to be able to cast people in this and that's automatically going to green light the movie. It's like, yeah, that, that can go off and happen. I mean, it's certainly, we wrote it from a standpoint of like, there's a very clear vision here, but that can be translated. So. Studios are pretty, um, at least in our, from our limited experience, they do seem excited about directors who are generating their own material. Mm -hmm. If they really like the script and really believe in it, um, it's, it, they're, I, I think that they're open to, to, director, to you directing the material as well. Yeah, and I think that's also like for them an easier pathway to production too. And, um, that certainly helped us with a few of our projects being writer directors that if you write something that's very producible um, that's more attractive because usually the process is okay the studio or production company gets a script now they have to go out and chase a bunch of different directors to see who's interested and, and, then, it's a process. and then by the time they find a director the director comes in with a bunch of notes then they got to hire another writer to address the notes then the script doesn't turn out very well then they got to fire the writer hire another writer you know what I mean like they they, they want the fastest path to production, so writer directors uh, pretty good way to go. Yeah, uh, what kind of avenues did you guys take to uh, make the money to produce your guys' films, um, yeah. especially like before you uh, went out to Los Angeles? Yeah, so like all of pretty much all of our movies, um, like when we were in high school or whatever, those we kept under like three hundred bucks. Like most of them were like closer to fifty bucks. So. Um, <laughs> When we did Impulse, this, which was our short film that was a little larger in scale, um, Kickstarter wasn't around, or I think it was like in its infancy. Um, so we didn't have that, that resource. And so for us, we just reached out to our family and our friends, and we were like, look, this is a short film, it's never gonna make a dime, so don't expect like an investment, but uh, don't look at this as an investment financially, look at it as an investment in our careers. So what we were able to get there and we're incredibly grateful to this day about it is they put in the belief in, in the form of a nice check that was written out to our LLC. <laughs> and and we also like had a deal where we we're like, okay, we're going to give you a stake in our careers too. Like if you're investing in this, then we'll invest in you back. Um, and we we're like, you know, for future earnings, like you get a certain percentage. And so that was kind of like the, the weird deal that we were able to, to put together. But yeah, we just didn't have the luxury of like Kickstarter being out there, which obviously is, is a nice resource. So, yeah. I, uh, I, I think we're right. We're right at the five minute mark here before we have to wrap this up. And uh, there was just one last question that I kind of wanted to ask you guys. Um, for anybody that's out here in the audience right now or anybody watching um, who's maybe going through that moment where it's that low moment mm -hmm. in their career, what would you say to them right now to maybe keep them going or to, to not let go of, of that, that dream and that passion? Right, yeah. Um, I mean, I, all I can say is like, not only have we been there, but we live there. <laughs> we live yeah. in that low moment. And that low moment always leads to something better because it, it is a tough career. A lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of, um, a lot of rejection, uh, being a creative, is, is challenging work, it's emotional, 
Um, you're putting your feelings out there and presenting it to the world, and the world is going to be like, I don't get you, and, and, and that's going to that stings um, sometimes. But uh, um, I, I, yeah, I think it's just um, go back to like the basics and be like, what do I have in my backyard? And even if you're not a director, like if you're a writer, like what can you write about, and who are the people around you that you can kind of surround yourself to make this a reality? And I think it'll feel incremental every every single step of the way. Um, making movies is such a slow process and a hard and grueling process um, that you really just have to put one baby step in front of the other. And so don't look too far down the barrel. Like just look at what's right in front of you. And if you have resources around you that you can make movies with, just go out and do that. They don't have to be ready to be shown on theaters like 4,000 screens across the nation. Um, but you'll get there with enough tenacity. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again so much for coming out. This has been really awesome. And thank you to everybody who came out today to come support Iowa filmmaking and uh, part of the process. So. Thank you guys. Yeah, so thank you. Very much. Establishments. <laughs> <laughs> so.